Thank you for your company. In this week's episode of Resource PNG, we talk about the oldest running mine in Papua New Guinea, Oktedi. Oktedi is situated in the Star Mountains. Before the mine started, there stood in the very site a mountain called Mount Fubilan. The name Fubilan is the English equivalent of the Min word Fubilan, which means steep and slippery place, and steep it was. The mountain was 2,084 meters high. The locals believe that it was occupied by nasty spirits or Magalim. The site is breathtaking. The Star Mountains got their name from a Dutch surveyor in 1914, and like other parts of PNG, this remote location is rugged terrain. Oktedi Mining Limited has taken almost 30 years to mine Mount Fubulan, and they are still at it. The amount of earth that has been moved has now been washed down the Fly River, or else it has been stored as rock waste. Earlier in the Earth's history, due to the movement of tectonic plates, something called a porphyry system was created. In the case of Mount Fubilan, it was a copper-gold system. The special properties of copper and gold make it easier for scientists to predict where they can be found. In the 1960s, a group of scientists started tracking this mountain range that forms the spine of PNG to see if they could find precious metals. A Canadian company called Kennecott gambled on this idea and did a very thorough analysis of the streams that flowed from these mountains. The theory was, if there is copper or gold anywhere here, the water would have it. That's how they found the Yandra deposit in Bundi, Medang. Kennecott pressed on with its exploration, this time with three Bundi men and a team of geologists, John Felderhoff and Doug Fishburne, and field assistants Chris Larkin and Tom Harvey. At the point where the Oktedi and Okmenga rivers meet, the team found traces of copper, a substantial amount of the metal. Then there was the difficulty of exploration drills, that is to prove up the reserve, to determine just how much ore there was in the earth. And everything had to be flown in by helicopter. One of the men from Bundi called Manga was instructed to construct a landing pad for the choppers at Mount Fubilan. After he, along with local men, cleared the landing pad, he remarked, Planti ayanistab. Indeed, when Kennecott went to check, there was a lot of metal ore there. What they found was a world-class porphyry copper-gold deposit. Early estimates stated a copper grade of 3.05% and gold was at 0.11 ounces per tonne. By 1971, results from the exploration drilling that was done by Kennecott was favorable, but they could not come to an agreement with the state. By 1975, Kennecott withdrew from Papua New Guinea. The following year, BHP started talks with the government, and soon a feasibility study was conducted and presented. By that time, BHP had concluded that the ore body contained more than the ore reserve target of 250 million tons of copper grades of 0.852%. So by 1981, OTML was incorporated and started construction. By 1984, gold production was already in full swing, and copper production followed three years later. The people that occupy the mining area, according to the occupants at that time of discovery, was the Wapkaimen. Their neighbors were the Faiwolmin, Mianmin, Baktamin, Bikmin, Ekiakmin, Tefalmin, and the Atbalmin. Notice how all the names end with Min. That is why the local people are known by the name the Min. The people were so isolated that prior to the mine, most of these people would not have met the neighboring villages, nor would they have met more than 20 people in their whole lives. Their staple diet is taro. The land here in these steep mountains is made of a lot of limestone, so the high alkalinity makes it difficult to grow any other crop. Now with the influx of people and mining activity, the population around the township of Tabubil and the mine is about 10,000. When we come back, we talk more about the operations at the mines. Do stay tuned. Octedi Mining Limited has almost three decades of experience in moving a 2,084 meter high mountain. And the scale of their work is mind boggling. Not only are they moving a mountain, they have to deal with an annual rainfall of about eight meters of water per year. The mountains have 
waterfalls and creeks everywhere. Most of their major tributaries have the phrase ok, which means river. We talked to some of their very dedicated OTML workers to get an insight on how they go about bringing down this massive mountain to extract the gold and copper from its interior. Octedi is almost 30 years old and there are a number of people that have benefited from this mine in terms of training. Octedi has a Papua New Guinean in the position of mines manager, Mr. Peter Nupiri. So what really goes on at a mine like Octedi? On a daily basis, uh, we would like to mine uh, uh, approximately 160-170 thousand tons, of which uh, about 70 to 80 thousand will be all delivered to the crusher and the rest will be, will be waste. A very important aspect of any mine will be the geology department. They say where to look and suggest the best method for extraction. They go through all the complicated analysis of how to mine. Main objective as geology, first of all, is to help the operations in terms of uh, finding the, 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 the mineral deposit that is exploration function and this secondly is to define and to delineate properly those mineral deposits which we find so that they can be economic to the company and the last part of the geology function is mine geology which is basically to help the diggers in the pit in the operation to dig properly and send to the mill what is required. Technical drawing is an essential. Drafts persons get to draw what the scientists and other professionals see. Peter Haunim, a survey draftsman, has been with Octedi for almost 30 years. I was in Medeng as a draftsman. And then, uh, early days I come up here as a survey draftsman with the surveyor who were doing the surveying, which is willing and partners. While I was working here, I learned to do things in the computer. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Before I used to do it in freehand, doing all the drafts in freehand, but now it's in the computer. There is a lot of work that is being done here and the person who oversees all operations in the mine pit is Mr. Augustin Wama, pit project and maintenance manager. My main uh, focus is about looking after the after the project, especially, you can see, see out there, there's, there's a project that's going on. That's, that's what I look after. And pit walls, uh, road maintenance is to do with the roads, uh, building up new ramps or building up new roads. That's what I do. Well, I, when I first came here, I, I started as a driller. I started drilling and then uh, I, I moved on into operations and then uh, started driving trucks, uh, dozers, graders, loaders. And then I went up into doing dispatching, and then I went into training, and then uh, do some training work, and then I went into operation again uh, to do production, and then into to where I am now. Since the OTML team is getting mineral ore out of the ground, they have to use explosives. That is the faster way of transforming rock to rubble. They have had years of experience blasting the mountain to bits. I do organize and um, look after things uh, day and day to day blasting out in the pit. And sometimes I, I do coordinate, coordinate blasting. You know, when we are doing blast clearance and all this, we have to take people out, out from blast area, especially where we are blasting down at the pit. Some of the uh, challenges that uh, I faced, especially when we are blasting, you know, along the contour and, uh, you know, blasting. Uh, near the infrastructure, like office area and uh, crasa and all this, we have to be really caref careful in doing, doing things. Blasting will basically crumble the mountain, so there has to be a process of gathering. Since the pile of rubble is pretty huge, the doses that gather these piles are handled remotely. Then these are dumped onto huge haul trucks. Haul truck drivers get state-of-the-art training in the mine site in a simulator where they practice their driving skills. And there are a number of women that operate these gigantic machines. I'm the most sorry. I'm most the disabled because I'm working with the man. I come through the PED program and also give me about two years. 
two years law training we follow two years and we plus action work straight permanent job straight so we stop two years and we become a permanent operator um we come first look at all trucks and we look at size that's all i'm saying for it me pour it now. Me pour it logo close to the old trucks too. Once first, me touch in the truck, yeah. Second time goes, and now I must me feel confident. But in charge, in team, me at most me, some of me was still working it's a work by man yet. We make it. Now me confident, work stuff. Now I must me, I must lo work, work, work low TML, especially low mine operation and. I'm working in environment all man and I'm from America I'm still work for months. <laughs> so I'm me I'm uh, so man too respect me as an American and work work done. Now me too me got me still got respect all mm-hmm. man. So I'm in that way I'm saying we play respect each other and we work with the right and stuff. We're talking to Octeti Mining Limited, more about their operations and the benefits they are bringing to the people after the break. You're watching Resource PNG. A government officer named Leo Austin, who was based in Darrow in the 1920s, once stated that the Star Mountains would never be of much use from a commercial point of view for many years to come, unless, of course, one stumbles across some valuable minerals. Well, Kennecott did stumble across valuable minerals, copper and gold. And since it started, Octeti Mine has been supporting the country's economy and will continue to do so for the life of the mine. From the pit, mineral ore is crushed into smaller pieces and sent via conveyor to the mill. Once the ore gets to the mill, two things happen. There is the grinding and flotation. Grinding rock to dust takes a team of professionals. When the rock comes in, goes uh, first into the seg mills. And uh, the seg mills are used for breaking down the really large rocks. We have classifiers in the grinding circuit that, uh, that classify the material by size. The stuff that is still large is sent to the bone mills. And the bone mills are the machines that we use to grind the, the rocks to a really very fine size. Uh, we get rocks uh, as Big as 250 millimeters. When That's the out? top size mostly. Uh, when they come down, uh, come out, they're like uh, about 200 microns. That's what we uh, normally feed to the flotation circuit. On, on a good day, we treat about 70,000 tons of ore from the mine. At the grinding stage, the rocks are put into crushes to pulverize them into powder. The size that they want the grains of powder to be at is between 180 and 200 micrometers, which is dust. What comes after the powder has been created is flotation. Flotation involves very complicated process, but basically it involves immersing the now powdered ore with liquid chemicals that will allow the compounds that contain copper, gold and silver to stick together. Then they pass it through another chemical like laundry powder. Air is passed through this liquid mixture to create a gray bubbly froth. The gray froth is where all the good stuff is. The mixture goes through this process several times until all the minerals that they could possibly extract are taken out. From what is skimmed off, the workers take out the gold to form gold bars. What is left is copper and other metals. From there we recover the copper sulphide minerals from the, the waste rock. We recover about 85% of the copper in the ore and we make a concentrate with a grade of about 26% copper. So that copper concentrate is then transported by pipeline to our port at Kiunga and uh, the waste product goes into the tailings disposal system. As for the tailings, this has to be treated before it is dumped into the octeti. 
In 2008, the mine introduced the Mine Waste Tailings Project. In this process, the pyrite is taken out of the tailings to produce a pyrite concentrate. The tailings is then neutralized by being treated with lime before it is dumped into the Oktedi River. The pyrite concentrate, however, is piped down to Big A. The whole operation involves a lot of dedicated workers. I basically look after the day-to-day -day operation of uh, mill, from the mill down to the storage area, which is done at Ganagai. From the control room, we overlooked or oversee the whole uh, processing plant, from the crusher down to Kionga and it includes women. Here is one of them, Miss Nancy Safarius, an operator at the mill. I'm a process plant operator in uh, Octeri. Uh, basically, we control and monitor the process, uh, mineral processing here. Um, we uh, assist um, the maintenance guys, the metallurgists, to uh, operate the plant in a safe and uh, effective way. Well, uh, it's more like a male-dominated area, but it's great. I fit in perfectly, and it's fun. I enjoy it. Big is the place where dredging of the silt that has been deposited by the Octedi happens. This is also where the pyrite concentrate is stored. The dredge that we operate here at Big A is basically a cutter section dredge. It, it operates within a section of the river that we we, we term to describe as the slot. So essentially the slot is a, a sediment trap, which is about uh, 850 meters in length, uh, 200 meters in width and 20 meters deep. So dr the dredge operates annually throughout this section of the river, basically dredging out the sediments and pumping through floating lines and land-based land lines onto the stockpiles. Um, we, we try to dredge out annually around 10 million cubic meters of, of sand, which is about 17 million tons of material from the river. Um, what we try to do is to be able to match essentially some of what's coming down or being discharged up at the mine. So the majority of that volume of material is placed on design engineered stockpiles on the, the east and the west bank. With regard to the pyrite pits uh, and the storage of pyrite on the west bank at Big A, um, we've created engineered structures and engineered pits that, are ge that should be geotechnically stable and, and they're within a geological formation which should provide uh, a cap for that um, containment. In addition to that, we have or will be placing on top of the pits in excess of 10 meters of cover material. So that allows for that encapsulation of the pyrite within the pits. The location of the pits themselves are not towards the boundary of the stockpile. They're within the center, essentially, of the stockpile on the West Bank. So that also provides additional buffer between the river and the stockpile itself. After the break, we will have a look at other sustainable benefits that Octedi has brought to the people of Western Province. Dredging the Fly River is just one way that OTML is trying to minimize the mine's impact on the river. The company continues to monitor the river's systems and the environment. Despite what has happened in the past, they believe it is very important that OTML helps the people build a sustainable future. Here are some of the projects that they have started. It seems that the name Octedi Mines is synonymous with environmental damage after reports of major upsets to the river systems down the fly. In 1999, BHP reported that contaminated tailings had caused widespread damage along the fly. Back then, the company dumped 80 million tons of contaminated tailings into the river system every year. It was also reported that the amount of copper concentration in the water is 30 times higher than normal, but it is well below the World Health Organization standards of 1.3 milligrams per day. This is the cause of concern for all involved in the mines. Since the PNG government took over the mine with PNG SDP, environmental monitoring is an ongoing practice. And we also look at the water quality of the Octedi Fly River system. We look at the uh, sediment uh, 
uh, transport deposition, reactivity, and interaction with sediment with water, and water interaction with the biology, like fish, for example. We have a requirement to uh, collect uh, water quality or water samples from the system, from Octeri all the way to, uh, to the South Ply, uh, on a monthly basis, at locations and frequency nominated in the regime. From our monitoring data, Octeri, in terms of drinkability, it is safe to drink after the suspended sediments are settled. In terms of uh, safety for the uh, ecological health, no. Uh, we, the, uh, the trigger value is, uh, has been exceeded. That, that was, uh, I think, from the early, early days of mining op mine operations. Uh, when the current regime was implemented in 2001, the, the trigger values or the thresholds for, for the um, uh, copper was exceeded. After the tailings are dumped into the river and the erosion that has been happening since the mine's operation, the once deep, slow-moving river has become shallower, developing rapids in some parts. The sedimentation that has been dredged is now being dumped along the riverbed. The stockpile that are gathered on the banks are meters high. Since rains and floods are frequent in these parts, the high mounds pose a threat. The only safe way to hold these mounds together is to plant shrubs on them. We, we have to monitor the soil uh, to see that it is not shifting and eroding away. Water samples are taken wherever there is seepage from within the stockpile into the surrounding streams. That water is monitored chemically to make sure that it is also within the, the requirements. Other mine sites use soil to actually do their revegetation on, but in our situation where we're working with a, a dredged sand, this is unique and if we can, not if we can, we have to make this successful. The whole reveg project depends on us learning how to grow crops in these conditions. Uh, once we have work this out, uh, the, the rest of the revegetation would be easy and I'm sure this knowledge could be used by other mines that follow who perhaps have the, the same unique situation as what we do. Exploration by OTML shows that there are reserves in the west of the mine pit, the west wall. This falls under the Mine Life Extension Plan or MLE. It's a process in itself, but that would mean more activity but at a smaller scale. The rock waste will be dumped at Harvey Creek towards the southeast of the mine pit. Harvey Creek is a tributary that feeds into the Okmani River. Geotechnical surveys have already been conducted to test the stability of the site. All other processing will be the same in terms of piping the pyrite concentrate and the slurry out of the mine. So with the Mine Life Extension project, things are looking up for the mine. Well, mining's a very, very expensive business. Yeah, these big new haul trucks, the Caterpillar 793s, they're over $5 million a piece, you know, and uh, we, we'll probably go up to about 50 of those. Um, you know, this big heavy mining um, equipment that we use, you know, the shovels, it's, it's a very expensive operation. And so it's, um, uh, but it's not only that also, it's the, you know, it's the fuel costs and here we bring um, all our diesel in here and we use about 120 million litres of diesel um, uh, a year. Mining operations will slightly change. Uh, there is a time gap that is going to happen because the time we finish the current uh, ore body in the, in the current pit uh, and the time when we start seeing some ore in the cutback and the mile of extension, uh, that time is widening every time we're not doing much. Subject to government approval, if we can get, get into that uh, government and community approval, if we can get into uh, the, the full swing of the mile of extension, that helps reduces the time gap. Initially, in the early years of mine life extension, we were, we're going to really ramp up because uh, we will be mining the current pit to keep the current operation going as well as stripping waste. And so it is going to really ramp up. We will, we will, we will probably see an increase by about 50%, and then it will, it will slow off as we strip all the waste out and we finish mining from the bottom of the pit and we're only mining the uh, ore from the cutback. That will, that will significantly drop. How will operations be affected during the mine life extension? 
It seems the quest to bring down the West Wall will have its challenges, but the experts are already looking at the finer details. In the initial phases, we're going to have a lot more activity because we're in running the current mine as we're doing it now. But we're also stripping off that top of that mountain over there. Uh, so it'll take more people, uh, more equipment. The mill may have to change their approach too. There won't be a lot of changes to the mill actually, even though the throughput will be less. But as the ore is harder, we'll still need all of the plant and the equipment that we currently operate and therefore much the same number in the workforce. The MLE will also affect operations at Big End. Well, my life extension would allow us to be able to basically cap off the East Bank, the stockpile that we have on this side, and um, progress on with um, work on the West Bank. It also would uh, impact uh, the number of pits we have. Uh, es essentially, um, there's, if we continue with mine life extension, there might be the need, depending on uh, the changes in um, production, for another pit, and uh, that would uh, be determined by uh, Emily. After the break, we will take a closer look at some of the other projects that Octeti Foundation is doing along the length of the Fly River. The Octeti Foundation is a multi-million Kina fund that is aiming to turn things around for the people of Western Province, starting from the North Fly right through to the mouth of the Fly River. It is not an easy task, but the team is determined to make sure that they create a sustainable way of life for the people, and they believe in starting from the grassroots level. The mine life extension will have an impact on the surrounding communities. Community relations will have to talk to the people, and that is a process that starts at the end of 2012 there would be a lot of consultative meetings. They, they will have to decide on that. Uh, for, for us is to uh, emphasize that this is a smaller business, a smaller mine, smaller revenue, so we expect small, uh, the benefits to also be aligned to the, the, the business as well. We are making it very clear that for my life to extend, or for MLE to occur, the communities must give that consent. If they, do, they decide to close the mine, we will close the mine. So we, we, we are pre prepared for both outcomes at, at the negotiations. From the meetings that we've had, we started off initially in 2009, there was uh, talks about well, maybe not, maybe yes. So fr from the records that we have, from the meetings that we have had, is that the communities are almost 100% want the mine to continue. Small as it is, PNG is a very diverse country. That makes it extra challenging for projects because each community handles issues differently and the phrase one size fits all does not apply. And for the extractive industry, community relations would be the key people to handle such issues. Octedi, unlike other mines, uh, we take into account the impacts that have been caused through the discharge of waste of the mine. Prior to the mine's existence, there was hardly any service in the Star Mountains. The average lifespan of the min was about 35 years. The mine has brought services to the people. Today in Tabobil, the health care they get from their hospital is world class. As the five-star hospital, you could tell from the time you, you, you enter here, the general environment is cleaned. Uh, like, there is a general order in it's easier for you to find where you're going to find those services and so forth. And there is a sense of, uh, like, you could feel a sense of things here are going well. They are able to come to our health, to our functional or operational uh, health service here at Tabubul. Um, they are able to come and seek services that they may not be able to seek in other places or in other health facility. And we do fly in visiting medical offices to come and provide highly specialized uh, services uh, that an ordinary people from the street or from the village would find it very difficult to, to find in the work location, but also having to find funds. It's costly to go down to Port Mosby or to 
other places to seek those services. One of the agreement between Divine Word University and OTML is to help Tabu Bill Hospital to provide health services management to this facility, Tabu Bill Hospital, the six mine villages, uh, eight posts. In addition to that Part B, the agreement requires that OTML and Divine Word University work collaboratively to develop this hospital into a, a training hospital. In so we're going to be starting off with a uh, building of a, a new facility at the front, the front of this hospital, which will accommodate the accident and emergency, the outpatient services clinics, the uh, pathology, laboratory department, x-ray department, as well as the administration and a, uh, and a room for a conference room for training services. OTML wanted to work with what they already have in their existing healthcare system, but they wanted to build on this through the North Fly Health Services Development Program. 2008, in collaboration with the provincial government and um, North Fly Health Service Providers um, to improve the health of the people of North Fly. At the time, uh, the health indicators were very poor for the North Fly District people. So TML uh, decided to come up with this uh, new program initiative, the North Fly Health Service Development Program. And through this program, they have noticed a number of improvements. Just let me take an example of one immunization, for instance. If I take on the uh, pentavalent immunization, uh, back in 2007, it was, uh, it was around 55%. And uh, today we are on 75 per, 75%. So we've made some progress in terms of some of the immunization coverage areas. These uh, vaccines that we use, for instance, the pentavalent, you know, it protects uh, against whooping cough, diphtheria, tetanus, and, and things like that. Um, polio vaccine is a Sabine, it's, uh, it's for pol polio. Um, measles is another one. So a number of these uh, vaccines that we use for prevents against various forms of disease. And we've made some improvements in some of those coverage and our figures are starting to come up. This, the other area that we have focused more on is the antenatal coverage. At least we must, you know, in PNG, we must at least visit one pregnant mother, visit her during the pre time of pregnancy. Uh, our coverage is so far in 2007, you know, it, it was around uh, uh, 57, and now we brought it up to about um, close to about over 90 percent. So we're making a lot of progress in those areas as well. Kyunga, once described as a sleepy township, has been transformed quite drastically into a hub of business activity. Over the years, the town has experienced an influx of services because this is the main port where the copper concentrate slurry from the Octedi mines is exported overseas. It's become a center for trade and the people have seen a difference. We have a filter dryer and we dry our copper concentrate and we load that onto ships. We also have a cargo wharf where we load and unload all the cargo that is not flown into Tabubal. We load and unload all the cargo down here in Kyunga. We supply power to the town free of charge. We also supply water and sewage free of charge. We also supply maintenance and assistance to the local government hospital. And we provide uh, maintenance of the main highway that comes from Tabubal towards Kyunga. When we return, we shall have the last part of that report to stay with us. Octedi Mine is nearing its closure, but OTML has a mine life extension plan. The experts believe that there is more copper and gold to mine within the area. What about the people? Well, the company and the people are determined to make the best of this opportunity, and with the help of the Octedi Foundation, they think they can achieve this. The Octedi Development Foundation is one of the benefits from the Octedi Mines that the people of the Western Province enjoy. They have so far introduced shipping vessels, the Fly Hope, the Fly Warrior, and the Fly Explorer, and even planes. OTDF works on ensuring that there is some sustainable way of life for the people. Trust investment funds are funds dedicated for secure investments on behalf of the communities. 
Uh, they actually represent 10% of uh, all of the funds that are given to the communities directly by OTML. And at the moment, there's 90 million Kina in that fund. We established three specific rules around those funds. Uh, that was to ensure that the investments were highly visible within Western Province, so that the communities who uh, make those investments can see what their investments are. Uh, they can actually touch and feel and understand those investments. Uh, we also determined that the investments should return significantly more than the rate of inflation of the country. Uh, currently, those funds are sitting in interest-bearing deposit accounts, earning around about 2% or less per annum. The OTDF works on projects to do with a number of areas, including sustainable management, deer farming, and rubber and eagle wood plantations. The OTDF wants to make a change in the lives of the village people. <laughs> Those villages include places like Ayambak, Kautri, Kavianangai, near Obo, Moyan, and Atkamba. There is a place near Suki called Kautri. This village is termed the model village. Why? Well, this community has leaders that are determined to develop a better way of life for their people. <laughs> This is all about sustainable living, so targeting the next generation is the key. Cowtree Elementary School teachers are doing their bit to help the children. Like they're young children and they're just beginning to understand and they can see in reality what's happening. And as they're growing up, they're very excited and they're happy because um, things coming up, uh, it's new to them. They haven't experienced such things like this before and they're very happy about it. It's very interesting today, so when this uh, project is coming up, students are interested to, which we normally tell them, uh, like this, like this is coming up. And they are also planning, they are also, we should tell them, uh, you school hard, okay. You'll be able to get a job here. Or if you fail, you get a job here. The older generation believe that they can do this. Education and health, basic services, are what the people of Kautri want to have. They want to ensure that the future generation have that. Me, also, me, a model, like, show him, not a community, like, look him, all by walking one kind. The suppose no God, all yet, by walking decision, like, all yet. So, me, people, mamas, because me, look him, also, me, people, by, when he walk out, one time me feel him awesome. Me at me feel him awesome. One time community, because me people walk, boom, na contribute, na lick lick, na lapun, me people walk, boom. The older generation have the wisdom and experience, but they need youthful vigor to assist with building. This is where the young men and women come in. A young man in the village Sadawa Pikina stopped attending school at just grade four due to financial difficulty. He returned to the village. Now seeing that his village was chosen for this project, he and other youths joined forces to build an enclosure to raise deer. Me pla been round nothing, lo place, no got thinking lo future blo me pla, time chief blo me pla lo place, Mr. Dubki Apuga. Advice me pla lo. Walking one block project lo place and me pla understand him na me pla walking pinis and me stop lo out through now and dia farm project na eagle wood. This la project me pla walking lo place. And by straight him sin down lo me. Na be in all beginning he come up by stop lo this la, this la. And these are the animals they are domesticating four females and a male. The stag, which they have called Waniamku, means tailman. About two-thirds of the Western province population live along the fly. The common mode of transport is by water. That is why the OTDF introduced the Fly Hope, a shipping vessel that can carry up to 150 people, including cargo. This has made travel along the river safer and convenient. With this service, they have seen a lot more business happen along the river. An entrepreneur named Christina Sangi saw a business opportunity in the Western province and moved here. Christina is from East Sipic. So, 
from Obo Guanta Plo Kiunga na Salimolo. Kiunga, Tabu Bill, Gimolo Hotels, our guest house. Before me looking at me, I had to miss you. I didn't get to go to the hotel. I had to take two days to go to the hotel. And she is not alone. Her business partner, Rodney Lelai, a man from the neighboring Gulf province, also thinks this is a good place to do business. Well, I'm going to work in the city of town city. I'm going to work in the city of the place of the city. I also approach the government by giving you work or local level government by giving you In order for any project to happen, you need land. And land is a hard thing to come by, especially in a country like Papua New Guinea, where only 3% of the land mass belongs to the state. A landowner at Bonai village in Moyan, in the middle fly, thinks different. I a big play interest, Lord, people blow me web. I look at myself after the mine closer. One and benefit through or by Kisim. Me plus I was a mind close. Me plus no got one plus something look go back or something. Me plus like him development or something behind the mind close. Me plus our people must open up. Or something me talking or people blow me. Me plus must give him ground. And his wife believes this is a better approach too. Oh, me plus thing was a money blowing them good plus to you me. Come start no try try no this lah because me plus work garden now garden bush now me plus looking for them. He got the girl wood grow lo here. Or same na mi plato gatin this lay mas place where mi plato can grow in wiggle wood so mi plato give him ground in wiggle PNG STV one time O T D F lo all can come na ah time long ah planting wiggle wood lo here so mi plato can look him back grow good. In this very flat part of the province, the OTDF is working with what they are given. Rather than introduce something that will be hard to maintain, it's best to work with the environment and what the people are already good at. One such concept is rubber. Rubber plantations are almost as old as the mine itself as it was introduced as a cash crop in the 1960s. There is a processing factory in Kyunga. At Atkamba, North Fly, a young person who wants to put his learning to good use is Tao Mangeman. He works as an assistant field officer with the OTDF in the district. He wants to see sustainable living for the people in these parts. This income group like one of your living standard blow hole. So that all can plan him all this la lobby and future time blow all now all by kissing money out of this rubber. He does what is called a budding process where they combine two different types of rubber species to create a hybrid. Uh, but graphene is um, simply lo kissing all different type of clones. Clones and people are collecting all the samagos. Now this la clones people are using and K2 clone. So after harvesting, we plant kisimol come loya na, or mangi blom we plant loya or kisimol na or pilimol one time, body knives. We plant save them all side sides, then we plant create them all windows or rootstocks. We plant create them all windows or rootstocks na we plant pet them all bud graft, bud pets. I see, we plant pet them all or rootstocks. Ah, rootstocks. Clear message for us is that. We're actually based with the communities. This is one of the trust investment projects. Uh, we actually have two coming in. This is a brand new Series 400 Twin Otter. Uh, they've only been just made again for the first time in more than 20 years. Uh, so it's great for us. This is the first one that's going to be operable in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's great to be able to bring one in on behalf of the CMTA communities. It'll be chartered permanently to Octeti Mining and uh, guarantee them an 8% return on both the assets. The people have seen a lot of changes during the life of the mines. Some have seen much benefits, others not so much. But the people of this sparsely populated province are looking at long-term benefits and they believe that Octane Mining Limited can still provide that. Well, this company has been here, um, as you say, um, 28 years in operation. This is our 30th year in existence. It is a marvellous company. Um, we are very, very proud of this company. All the employees are very proud of it. It is a major contributor to this nation. We have gone through, as you mentioned, um, uh, environmental issues. We have a, a, an environmental legacy, and we are not frightened of that. We are not frightened of our environmental legacy. We know we have it, and we deal with it as best we can with our si or the best scientific knowledge that we have in this business. But seeing this mine is believing, and it is a fabulous part of the world. Papua New Guinea, you're very lucky with the um, the uh, country that you have and I would ask that you all look to protect it, develop it and nurture it because you have a fabulous country.
So thank you very much. And I thank my employees for having my wife and myself here in your marvellous country. Thank you very much.